Happy Friday, fellow wine lovers. It's Stephanie Miskew, a certified sommelier and author of The Glamorous Gourmet, here with you live on this fabulous Friday, uh, August 11th, with uh, my weekly wine picks, which I'm so excited to share with you today. Um, gosh, and today, as some of you know, if you've seen my reminders, we're gonna be talking back to school wines. Uh, and these are fabulous wines to enjoy and savor as you uh, watch the school bus driving off in the distance. So <laughs> in any event, um, oh, I see some of you are joining me already. If you're joining me, why don't you throw up a few emojis, a thumbs up, a heart, whatever floats your boat. Uh, I'd love for you to just, you know, let me know you're here. Uh, that would be fabulous. Um, as you know, I'm here with you every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, you know, talking about fun wine. So I'm always happy when you can join me. <clears throat> and what better way to kick off the weekend, right? We talk wine, get to know some new wines, hit the wine store on your way home, and you're set for the weekend. You're guaranteed to be drinking a nice wine all weekend long. So uh, if you're joining us, take a minute to get comfy. I'm gonna pull up the live video here on my laptop. There's a little bit of a delay, so bear with me. Here we are, are we here yet? And again, if you can hear me, let me know in the comments section. I'll be monitoring the comments throughout the show. So please leave me a comment and let me know where you're watching from. First of all, one, that you can hear me, and two, let me know where you're watching from. I always like to, to know, and if you have anything in your glass. I know it's a little early for some of you, but if you do have wine in your glass right now, you better share what it is. So, okay, here we go. Awesome. Okay, so now if there's anything you want to comment about uh, from here on out, just leave it in the comment section below, and I'll be happy to answer that for you as best I can. So... Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the format of our show. First of all, I'll introduce the theme, and I always talk about four wines. I talk a little bit about the wine, and then I taste through the wine, obviously. And again, feel free to ask questions or comments um, whenever you like. That's fine with me. I like to keep the these to about 20, 30 minutes, although I know last time you went about an hour, and that's fine too. If you have questions, I'm here as long as you need me anything for wine lovers, right? So feel free to just ask away and I'll do the best I can. Also, if you're watching this video after the live broadcast, please be sure to jump in and ask questions and comment as if you were watching it live. I monitor uh, the questions and comments for weeks after these things air, so I'd be happy to get your question answered. So please just watch it and again, ask questions, comment along, join in the fun. Um, and I will do my best to um, get your questions answered. Also, on the right-hand side of your screen, there should be a little button that says Get Notified When I Go Live. If you want to click that, if you want to get notified when I'm live, that would be great. Um, I'd appreciate that if you wouldn't mind. So, as I mentioned, today I'm going to be sharing what I call back-to-school wines. Because, I mean, let's face it, you've already spent uh, all your money on tuition, school supplies, uniforms, and everything that goes along with the kids going back to school. So, who's got money left to blow on expensive wine? So, all the wines I'm going to be featuring today are great values. Uh, they're great values from around the world. And there are wines that, of course, you can toast your, uh, make a toast as a school bus drives off. But these are also great wines to have in your house, what I call house wines. I think every wine lover, you can't be opening $50 bottles every night of the week. So, you know, it's nice to have a bottle you can reach for and not even think about it. And the only requirements are, number one, that you like it. And number two, that the price is right. So again, it's always great to have these wines on hand. The wines I'm going to be talking to you about today definitely fall into that category. They're all under $20 a bottle, which is pretty affordable, and they're really tremendous quality. So I'm super excited to share them with you. Let me see. Tom Dank says, yo, yo, Tom. So psyched you can join us today. That's awesome. Anyone else here want to share? With oh, Oscar, I see you're there. Fabulous to see you as always. And I think I saw Howard there a minute ago. 
But in any event, I'm glad to see you, glad you can join us, and I think we're going to have some fun today. Let's see. So yeah, today we're going to be sampling wines from Italy, France, and Australia. I figure most of you already know a lot of value wines from, from the U.S., so I figured I'd focus on these regions that we might not think of when we're thinking, you know, thinking of value wines. So that's kind of why I picked the wines that I did, on top of the fact that, that I love them and we keep them around the house quite often too. Um, all right, so before we get started, if someone could just comment below and let just reassure me that you can hear me and you're there and all is well. Anybody? Or throw up an emoji, something? Let's see. Yeah, I think I'm coming in loud and clear. But, oh, that's all I needed. Thank you so much. Because sometimes they had some issues with the signal popping in and out, but it looks like we are good to go. So without further ado, all right, let's start our tasting, why don't we? Uh, all right, so I thought we would um, start out the tasting with the most celebratory wine, and that is our Mianetto Prosecco. And let me see if I can flip the screen for you like I've done in the past. We're doing things a little differently today. And da, 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 there you go. Uh, it's the Mianetto Prosecco from the Treviso region of Italy. It's a brute. When you see brute on the label, you know the wine is dry. And I'm going to elaborate that on a minute. But it is a, a fabulous little Prosecco. You've probably seen this bottle before. If you have, let me know in the comments section below. Um, but... Yeah, it's it's common to see at grocery stores sometimes, and it, it, it's easy to find. And let's see. Oh, I hear you, good Oscar. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Awesome. Uh, but this is one of my favorites, and as I said, it, it's it's perfect for toasting your teen as they drive away or get on the bus, or it's great to keep in your fridge uh, for weeknight drinking, which is always great. Um, and if you've been to any of my events before, you know how much I love this particular Prosecco. And I love it for three reasons. Number one, because it's dry. It's not sweet. How many of us have picked up Prosecco off the shelf that we didn't particularly know and you go to try it and it's really sweet? I'm not a fan. Uh, I'm not a fan of sweet Prosecco. There are sweet wines that I like. Uh, Prosecco is just not one of them. So it's very crisp and dry. And again, it makes uh, drinking bubbly an everyday affordable thing, which what's wrong with that? I love bubbles. And three, this wine is perfect for also making sparkling wine-based drinks and cocktails like mimosas or bellinis. So this is a multi-purpose, fabulous Prosecco. Um, <clears throat> as with all Prosecco, awesome, yes. As with all Prosecco, it's from the northeastern region, the Veneto region of Italy. It's also made from the Glera grape. So that's the name of the grape. It's actually called Glera, and it's pretty much what all Prosecco is made out of. And what keeps the price of Prosecco so reasonable is it's made using the Charmat method, which unlike the, the method champenoise or method traditionnel that's used to make champagne, it's much, much less labor and time intensive the secondary fermentation, and that's just how sparkling wine gets its bubbles. The secondary fermentation occurs in a, in a stainless steel tank rather than individual bottles. So it makes, still makes excellent wine, but it just keeps the price to a minimum. And we like that because that, that allows us to drink sparkling wine every day, right? Uh, big, oh, good comment, Tom. Big glass for a Prosecco. Actually, when I drink sparkling wine, and you're right, normally if I were out, I would be drinking Prosecco probably out of a flute, but I like to drink most sparkling wines out of a white wine glass because it really allows you to um, get enjoy the aromatics of the wine better. It's, it's hard to get your nose in a flute, but I, and if you're ever evaluating sparkling wine or champagne like professionally, you'll always do it in a white wine glass. It just allows a better appreciation of the aromas, which gives you like a real insight into the wine. But that's a good question. We normally see it in flutes, but it's perfectly acceptable to drink your bubbly out of a white wine glass. Plus, I don't want to be switching up glasses for each wine this time. So it's a little bit out of convenience too. And I love these glasses. The glasses I use are um, Master Sommelier Andrea Immer came out with glasses called The One. And they are my favorite red and white wine glasses, generally speaking, because she's got one for red and one for white. 
you could go crazy with all the glassware for each individual grape variety but she again just does one for one for white and one for red and that's it so it really simplifies things and she's pretty fabulous herself so um, all right if there aren't any questions so far uh, why don't we go ahead with our tasting and for those of you joining us for the first time uh, I like to do the I think it's the six S's of tasting I added one in the mix there so we'll get to that in a minute so oh let's see Fran loves Prosecco before starters cheers to Fran I she's I'm with her on this I I it's perfect before as an aperitif you could drink it with the meal as I might have done once or twice but yeah it's perfect pretty much anytime it's so food friendly which is so nice about it so all right thank you for that cheers to Fran uh, so we're gonna go ahead in the first s of the tasting the of the six s's of tasting is C and there's so much you can tell about a wine just from looking at it as we've gone over before and I like to hold this up to a white background because it really gives you a good window into the color. And you can see it's a very pale lemon color, lemon yellow color. You can't really see the bubbles because I've been swirling and sipping out of it for a little while. But it should, you know, once you pour it, you'll see the bubbles rising up. It's a sign of virtually any sparkling wine. But this looks like a Prosecco should look. It's clear. It's not cloudy it's not brown at all if it were brown you might think it had been oxidized or something like that and it essentially looks young and fresh and delicious so the next s actually the two i pair the next four s's and they are swirl and sniff and sip and savor so swirl and sniff actually with bubbly I forego the swirl because that helps the bubbles dissipate and I just go right into the sniff. So let's go ahead. I'm going to give it a sniff. Oh, and on the nose, gosh, I, and I love this one too. It has beautiful aromas of white flowers and citrus and green apples. And it just like, it smells like it has a great acidity already. Are any of you Prosecco fans or sparkling wine fans already other than Fran? If you are, let me know. Or leave me a comment as to which wines maybe you like to drink already all right so that smells like I definitely want to take a sip so my next two S's are sit uh, sorry sip and swish and the reason I say swish is because you really when you're evaluating a wine you really want it to hit all the flavor receptors in your mouth so it helps to kind of swish it around a little bit ah. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a bubbly fan? Anyway, so you really kind of cleanses the palate. And again, the same on the palate as on the nose. Beautiful flavors of, gosh, lemon curd, or lemon and that floral thing is still going on. And green apple, it's crisp, it's refreshing, it's delicious. It's just what I had expected. So, and again, you, professionally, I would usually spit, but because it's Friday, and pretty close to happy hour uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna savor the wine which is with the savor you can savor or spit I'm savoring today folks and I hope you are too um, awesome so any questions about our delightful little Prosecco today before we move on to our next wine and I'll enjoy another sip while you're thinking about it so all right we might be good with that fabulous all right, so again, perfect for toasting the teen as they get on the bus. And our next delightful back-to-school wine, let me pour myself a little, and then I will show you the bottle. And this is a pretty one, a pretty bottle. Not that the other one wasn't, but I love this bottle, and it's just such an amazing value. It is, let me flip the screen. It is a Chateau de saint Combe. Cote de Rhone Blanc, 2014 vintage, $16 a bottle, 13.5% alcohol. But isn't that just a lovely little label? And I mean, and you can find it basically $14 to $16. And let's see. Okay. And again, it, it's, uh, it's a wine, obviously, from France's Rhone Valley. Um, not, a, not a place I think many of us go to automatically for value wines. That's why I'm happy to share this one with you because I mean at 14 to 16 dollars a bottle the quality in this bottle is is mind-blowing. It's pretty amazing. 
Are any of you fans? Oh, let me see. Tom asks, what kind of cheeses would you suggest with the Prosecco? If you wanted to pair like with like flavors, I would pair it with a fresh goat cheese, like a chevre. Um, if you wanted to contrast, I would pair it with a brie. You can really go either way with that, and I love it pretty much with both. But if you really wanted to get a good synergy going, it is really delicious with the goat cheese. And the fresh goat cheese, like the one you find at the grocery store, it's kind of soft. Um, it's very tangy, and the Prosecco itself is very tangy as well. So it's just one of those, like, wow, what's going on? You know, it's really, really lovely. So give that one a try. But again, if you're a Brie fan, um, you'd get, like, the bright, crisp uh, bubbles of the Prosecco, and then you'd introduce the Brie, and you'd have this really nice contrast. And I like to say the bubbles in the Prosecco or any sparkling wine kind of act like those little scrubbing bubbles you see on the commercial, and they kind of scrub your palate clean and get your mouth ready for the next uh, decadent bite of brie. So give give each one a try and let me know what you think. You know, and again, no wrong answers. You might like one more than the other, but that's just my own personal advice, and I've done the legwork, so you can trust me. <laughs> um, okay, so again, this wine from the Southern Rhone Valley, uh, from the Cote de Rhone, and it, this is one of the oldest estates in the region. It dates back to the 15th century. And a gentleman by the name of Louis Berriol is the current um, proprietor. He took over from his father in the 1990s. They've been farming bio, or organically since the 70s and biodynamically since 2010. So that's pretty forward thinking for the region. But again, a very well-known family. They have a great reputation. They produce wonderful wines. And this is a little gem from them because a lot of the wines they produce are much more expensive. <clears throat> so the wine in the glass, it's a blend, as I mentioned, a 45% Viognier, 20% Marsan, 25% Peak Pool, and 10% Claret. Those are all very common grapes in the Southern Rhone. They might sound a little different to us. Have, have you heard of these grapes? I'd love to know. They're a little obscure, but Again, common in the Southern Rhone, and they each bring a little something different to the party. The Claret and the Pig Pool bring that beautiful freshness to the wine, while the Marsan and Viognier add the beautiful uh, kind of decadent quality to it because it has a really nice mouthfeel and beautiful floral aromatics that they're known for. So can you tell I like these wines? Anyway, I really like them. It's stainless steel fermented, which is important. We've been discussing that a lot during the summer. Stainless steel, when used uh, to refer to a wine, means the wine's going to be crisp and refreshing rather than oaky. Stainless steel is the opposite of oak, and oaked wines are generally, you know, more fuller bodied, a little higher alcohol, and more spice aromas and stuff like that. Um, Oscar, good question. Is it sweet? No. This is a dry wine that is fruity, but not sweet. But the fruit has, it's a lot of, has a lot of tropical notes to it. So at first it might seem like it might be sweet, but then when you try it, it has a very crisp, dry finish and it, it's really beautiful. So I'm gonna try through it now. That's a great question. Have you tried other wines like this that are sweet? Is that why you're asking? I'm assuming so, since I know you've tried a lot of different wines. Awesome. All right, so let's jump into our five S's. Okay, so C. Now you can see this wine is a lot darker in color. It's a deeper, more golden yellow than our previous wine. Um, and again, that's just because of the grapes and, and how they are. But yeah, it's a beautiful golden color. I just love it. Uh, there's, but there's no browning, there's no crystals in it, there's nothing floating in it, so looks like it should look. So we're going to proceed with our next swirl, and this is a swirl. That, that's pretty much it. If you're new to swirling, you just put the base of the glass on the table in front of you and trace little circles with it, and that will get it swirling for you. Oh, how far from Burgundy region? That's great. It's actually just south of Burgundy. You could probably take the train, gosh, an hour or so. It's not that far. Uh, I know when we were there, we almost went south. We went over to Bordeaux. But yeah, it's very close to the Burgundy region. It'd be a next, a logical next stop if you wanted to go somewhere else because it's very, it's pretty close. Pretty close. Great question though, Tom. Are you traveling over there anytime soon? You better tell me if you are. Okay, so now we're going to do swirl and sniff. Oh, 
and again this is one of those wines that just smells so pretty i want to dab it behind my ears before i drink it uh but the um aromas a beautiful honey uh pineapple i made some notes earlier lemon zest it does have that beautiful floral thing going on that's just i'm a fan for any wine when it has floral notes generally speaking if it's white or red uh, generally those are wines I really enjoy so I love the smell of this wine and I'm gonna go ahead and sip and swish yeah so very different from our Prosecco where that was light and crisp and refreshing this still has that beautiful acidity but it has a much more decadent mouthfeel and, and fruity but wow that acid kicks in at the end and it that is a very bone dry finish it's gosh and again it just lights up the sides of your tongue and that's that acidity folks when you take a sip of a wine and your mouth just immediately waters and you're all of a sudden craving food uh that's acidity and this has it in spades wow that is a beautiful beautiful wine and again 14 16 dollars folks i mean that that is a great great deal great deal and then uh, again, I sipped or it savored because again, it is Friday. So that I think I need another sip of that. But that is a is a great one. Out of the whites I've talked about so far, are you more inclined to try the Prosecco or the Coturon Blanc? Let me know in the comments section below while I take another sip. <laughs> um, the finish just goes on forever. That is one of my favorite values. I've I've discovered this wine a few years ago, and again, this is definitely one of our house wines. <clears throat> All right, everybody, still with me? If you are, throw up a thumbs up or a heart if you can. Just oh, you're just thinking of Fran and her Kool Aid tastes. You're so funny. <laughs> we're gonna find an awesome wine that Fran likes, other than her white sin. We're we're gonna do it. You know what? This would be one to try because it's fruity, but again, it's still dry, and I think it might appeal to her. So that's our mission now. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it, Oscar. I just know it. All right. So that was our Cote de Rome Blanc. If you're joining us for the first time, awesome. Thank you for that. If you're joining us for the first time, again, I'm Stephanie Miskew, uh, certified sommelier, author of The Glamorous Gourmet. We're talking back to school wines today, and we've just tasted through a Mionetto Prosecco from Italy and a uh, Chateau de Saint Combe Cote de Rhone from the Southern Rome Valley in France. Two great uh, value wines that are totally delicious. And now we're gonna move on to our reds. And if you have to happen to be watching this video, after the live broadcast be sure to jump in and comment and ask questions wherever you'd like uh and act like you are watching it live because i monitor that for weeks after and i'd be happy to get back to you and answer your questions so i think we have a question yeah awesome we're gonna do it we're gonna do it all right so let's kick off our reds with i have to pour myself some first all right, so we're returning to Italy. Oh, hold on, I think we have a question. There is a king, he has three glasses of wine. Two are full, one is, that's a riddle. Two are full, one is half full. What is his name? Hmm, two are full, half full. I don't know. Does anyone else know what that would be? I probably, sh there's a king, he has three glasses. I'm gonna have to mull that over, because I, I love a good, Philip the th ah, <laughs> Philip the third. <laughs> good one, Tom. I love a little wine humor. Oh, that's good. I love that. <laughs> Feel free to share your uh your wine jokes. I love them. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Bring them on. That's great. All right. So while I'm laughing, let's see if I can flip this now. All right, we're heading back to Italy and we're heading to Campania for this beauty. It's the Mastro Aglianico from Campania. It's IGT. The vintage is 2014, $15 a bottle and 12.5% alcohol. I say that off the bat because people invariably ask me and I just like to get that out of the way in the beginning because it's hard for me to see it on the bottle uh, when people finally do ask me. So, um, you know, and as I said before, or let's see, do we have any other comments? That, that was really funny. <laughs> uh, 
Love, love some wine humor. Um, as I said before, uh, some of the best values in the wine world uh, come from regions you might not be that familiar with. You just really have to know where to look. And that's why I'm so psyched to be doing these shows because I'm, I'm happy to introduce you to these regions. And then you can kind of do your own exploring, you know, as you see fit when you have time. Uh, but Campania in Italy is probably one of my all time favorite wine regions. They have beautiful white wines. Uh, like Greco di Tufo and Falangina and Fiano di Avellino. And they also have beautiful reds too. And this one, um, the grape is Aglianico. Um, they also uh, have one called Tarassi that's made from Aglianico. But this is a black grape that is grown in the southern region of Italy, mostly in Basilicata and Campania. And the vine originated in Greece and was brought over by Greek immigrants. But it's really, really special. You won't really find this one in the States much. But it's if you go to a good wine shop, they should be able to um, steer you in the direction of one of these wines. But I particularly like this one. It's from a wonderful producer. Um, let's see. And this family dates back in the region to the early 18th century. That's what I love about the old world wine regions like um, France and Italy. His the history goes back for centuries. I mean, and I love California dearly. But when you're talking about the wine industry, it pretty much only dates back about 100 years or so, maybe a little more. But you've just got this amazing history going on in, you know, in the old world. And again, these families, like the previous wine, I mean, the 1500s and the 18th century for this family. It's amazing. Uh, the owner right now, the owner is Piero Master Berardino. And this wine is made from 100% Aglianico. The wine is made from, I mean, is the grape is known for producing wines that are medium bodied, slightly tannic, but very flavorful. Uh, this wine was fermented a little bit in stainless steel and a little bit in barrel. So I have to say of all these wines, and I love them all, this one really dazzled me today. I do. So let's go ahead and we're going to jump in to our tasting. If anyone has any questions so far, again, feel free to pop them in the comment section. But all right, let's go ahead and look at this wine. Now, it's a little hard to tell, but this is, it's more of a garnet in color. I think you can see it there. And it's, it's pretty translucent. And I, I judge wines by whether you can read through them or not. You can just about read through this one. It's, it's a lot more translucent than like Cabernet Sauvignon or the very dark skin grapes that most of us are familiar with. But you can definitely, it, it's more translucent than, than those grapes. But let's go ahead. So it looks great. There's no browning. It's a beautiful bright garnet color. It looks like we want to take a sip, right? Yeah, thanks for that thumbs up. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to swirl and sniff. Oh, man, I'm telling you, this one is just, it's its fabulous. It's got beautiful aromas. Let's see, black cherry. Uh, yeah, black cherry and blackberry. But more importantly, and I think what makes it so nice it, is it's commented so beautifully by this earthiness. And... And it's like a forest floor. If you're walking through a forest after it rains and it kind of has that beautiful kind of loamy, earthy, but it's beautiful, but it's a beautiful aroma. So combine that with like ripe black cherry and blackberry. And I'm telling you, it just, uh, it, you just, I want to dive in and I'm going to go ahead and sip. I can't, can't wait any longer. <laughs> uh and again, it's just, it's, it's medium bodied. So it's not a huge, big, if you like Pinot Noir, you love this wine. It's not, it's not muscular at all. It's quite, it's quite delicate, but it still has those, um, those tannins. They're kind of softer tannins, but they're definitely still there. So don't think that it's just kind of wimpy. In addition to those beautiful flavors of black cherry, strawberry, it has like a strawberry balsamic thing going on. That's what it is. And again, that beautiful earthiness that's just so darn good, that, I'm telling you folks, that is one to seek out for sure, definitely. And then let me take another sip just to be sure. Yeah, and the finish goes on forever. And I don't think I've talked about pairings outside of the cheese one. This, so versatile, and they've suggested you pair with Baba Ganoush roasted fish. This is one of those reds you can serve with fish, which is also great because so many people, especially with all the fish we have down here in Florida, 
think, you know, no, no red wine with fish, but this is one of those red wines you could easily serve with fish because that acidity is so nice and it's just, it's just beautiful. So definitely want to seek out $15 a bottle. Amazing. Amazing. Any questions? Do share. Yes. <laughs> I wish I could. Here, you want a sip? <laughs> I wish I could give you a sip. Anyway, um, any questions about anything we've tried so far? If there are, again, just please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll get to them in between, uh, in between sampling wines, I'm telling you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. I let you know I've I've only been doing this is only my sixth one I think but you know that it means so much to see the little hearts and and thumbs up go by you know it's just because usually I'm presenting in front of a room full of people and it's you know you really get that immediate feedback when you're in front of someone you can see who likes the wine or you can you know interact with people so this has been a really interesting experience I like it and it's so fun interacting with you here but. Like without the benefit of having you in front of me, I love seeing the little emojis go up because at least it, it means you're listening. And, and again, I really appreciate it. So anyway, all right. So that was our Mastro Aglianico from Campania, Italy. And again, keep that region Campania in your mind. And that's one to explore, whether you like whites or reds. Again, it's a great, great, great region to explore and great values to be had, more importantly. Um, okay, so our final wine, let me go ahead and pour myself some. Anyone have big plans for the weekend? If you have, of course, just leave them in the comments section below. And in the meantime, I will show you our fourth and final wine, which is the Chateau Tenanda Grand Barassa Shiraz. Let's see. Ah. Grand Barassa Shiraz. I featured their Riesling a few weeks ago. The, uh, they are making fabulous wines uh, in Australia, Chateau Tenanda. Grand Barassa Shiraz from the Barassa Valley, Australia, 2012 vintage, $18 a bottle. Just, it's amazing. I'm telling you, there's so many values out there. There really are. You just have to know where to look. So I'm happy to help you explore them. So you really got you ready? Go to the Food Network. Ah, oh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> I appreciate that. You all are so nice. And it's, it's so fun hanging out with you all on Friday. I appreciate you the, taking the time to join us. All right, so Chateau Tenanda, as I said a few weeks ago, it's one of the oldest estates in Australia. At one point, it was the largest winery in the Southern Hemisphere, which is pretty amazing. It was founded in the 1890s, and it goes back a long way. But um, I think about 20 years ago, the Gaber family from South Africa, who were winemakers and vintners in South Africa, came to Australia. The guy saw the winery and bought it later that day. He just fell in love. And um, yeah, John Gaber. And they are producing. What I love about what they're doing in Australia is um, Australia kind of got a reputation, especially the Barossa Valley got a reputation for producing really high alcohol, jammy, jammy wines with not a lot of structure to them. And while there have always been beautiful wines, the Gaber family is kind of bringing back that more restrained style of wine. So while these wines have beautiful fruit and beautiful, you know, they're beautiful wines, but they are a little more restrained. They have a nicer structure and they're more food friendly as well. So I really like what they're doing um, with their wines, which is great. So uh, should be pretty easy to find in the store. Again, all of these wines are pretty readily available. And again, I'm working on our retail partner. I think I mentioned that a few weeks ago. Hopefully in the next week or two, I'll be able to share with you who that is. So um, they can kind of help expedite you getting the wines if you ever wanted to order them. So awesome. Um, okay, so the wine is 100% Shiraz. And yes, Shiraz and Syrah are the same grape. Not the same as Petite Syrah, which is something else, but the only difference uh, between Shiraz and Syrah is where it's from. So Shiraz is pretty much unique to Australia. That's what they like to call it, and that's fine. And the good thing about it is, you know when you hear the term Shiraz, 
it says a little bit about the wine stylistically, um, which kind of reflects the climate. Syrah from France, for example, is a little more restrained. It does have beautiful savory flavors and, you know, rather from tannins and, I mean, they're beautiful wines. But wines from Australia are so user-friendly. They have beautiful fruit, generally softer tannins. Um, and they're, I think they're more immediately enjoyable, and I think this wine demonstrates that beautifully. This one spent 18 months in French and American oak barrels, so it has some baking spice from the French oak, and it has that kind of vanillin sweetness, although it's not really sweet. It just has that vanilla flavor from the American oak. Uh, anyway, it's beautifully integrated, so let's go ahead. Has any Is anyone already a Shiraz fan? Did I ask that already? Anyway, if you are, please let me know. But if we look at the wine, this one is obviously darker than our previous wine. There's no, you can't really read through this one. It's more of a uh, purplish garnet color, so it's very dense. It's a little more inky than the first one. Although around the edge, uh, it it's lightens up a little bit, but not too much. So um, let's go ahead and I'll swirl and sniff. <sighs> Beautiful. Um, this one, this one has red and black fruit. It's got that ripe red cherry, but it also has plum and blackberry, and it's got a little hint of uh, orange zest going on, which make, gives it a little added complexity, which is really, really nice. I really like it. So cheers to you. Mm. That one, that's very, very nice. It's more fuller body than our Aglianico, but oh yeah, the, the layers and layers of cherry and blackberry and plum just open up on the palate. The tannins are a little more present than in the previous wines, although they're still pretty soft in contrast with the fruit. So it's, again, that acidity is lighting up my tongue. It's great. But, and whenever the, the, feeling of acid and tannins are different. Acid is a sensation when your mouth kind of salivates and waters and you it immediately makes you crave food. But when you feel that astringent sensation or you feel like the water is kind of being sucked out of your mouth, that's tannins, folks. That's tannins. They're kind of, they're astringent, they're drying. That, those are the tannins in wine. Sometimes they're really intense where they kind of like you literally feel like there's no more moisture in your mouth. That would probably happen from a young Napa Valley cab or a or a Syrah even from from France. But um, this one is just beautifully integrated. It's very nice. And in, you could always decant a wine if you thought the tannins were too much. Oh, let's see. We have some comments. Not really. Not really. I forget what we were talking about. Not really. Have you tried the Syrah maybe? Or I'm not sure. Oh, Tom says, I like the Holy Trinity wine. Grenache Syrah, more Vedra from the Barossa Valley. Awesome. Love that. And Granberg is the maker. Oh, fabulous. Thank you, Tom. I will be sure to check that out. Thank you. I love all your great suggestions and stuff. So keep them coming. Keep them coming. So again, the finish goes on forever. Yeah, and if you like a more full-bodied wine, if you are more of like a Merlot or a Cab fan, you'd probably like this wine more than the Aglianico, but, you know, it'd be worth trying them, I don't know, trying them both, but this is just, it's a beautiful example of what the Barossa Valley can do with Shiraz, so I think I'll take another sip. Mm -hmm. So those essentially are our um, back-to-school wines for the week. And gosh, it's hard to believe school is starting already. I don't even have kids and it's hard to believe it's starting already. It seems like summer just started. But so whether you would like to toast them as they, again, uh, get on that bus or you just want to have some fabulous value wines to enjoy during the week, I think these wines are some great choices. Um, uh, does anyone have, if anyone has any questions at all, again, whether you're watching this live or after we've already aired, please leave your comments and questions. I'd love the chance to answer them and get back to you. Um, I know this time is a little hard for some of you because you might be at work. I do think if you told your boss, though, they would understand. So, but again, that's up to you. <laughs> um, and let's see. If there aren't any more questions, I think we can kind of wrap up our tasting. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, we do have another question. How about a Chianti Classico suggestion? Gosh, you know, there are so many awesome Chianti Classicos out there, Tom. I'm a huge Chianti fan. Do you mean like a value option? Because there's some great 
there's some great value options, but then there's some pricey ones. Um, Felsina is one of my favorite producers of Chianti. They make just, God, gorgeous examples. Castella Diabola is a good one for a value option. You know, value. Yeah, Castella Diabola is great. Gosh, I in fact, I was just looking at, I have a whole bunch of them. Let me go check and I will leave them in the comment section for you because there's definitely plenty and there are, as you probably already know, amazing food wines. They're just, gosh, even with, you know, a plate of bolognese sauce on a Tuesday night, Chianti Classico is, is divine. That, in fact, that's where I fell in love with wine and knew I wanted to make it my career was in uh, Tuscany in the Chianti region of Italy. So I have a soft spot for it, but um, I will get back to you on that. Um, in fact, that might be a good idea for a segment, um, value wines from very well-known regions like Chianti, perhaps. So, you know, just, just always thinking for the future. But in any event, any other questions, guys? You have any plans for the weekend? Any wine-related plans or special bottles you're planning on opening? If so, tell me. Good old straw bottle. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even seen one of those in a while. That's funny. They're, they're hey, they'll always hold a, a spot in our hearts, right? It doesn't mean we have to drink them, though. Oscar says, thanks, Gigi. Another great schooling. Thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure. Uh, your homework, if you choose to accept it, is to find your value wine this weekend. Grab a few bottles, ask the person at your local wine shop to recommend some. Uh, if you could ask them for these bottles, if they don't carry them, sometimes they will order them for you if you're passionate enough about it. Uh, but that's a good wine shop will usually do that. So ask them if there's any of these you'd like to try. Um, Let's see. Also, to be notified of other live broadcasts, please subscribe. And I think there's a button on your screen that allows you to do that. Um, and please spread the word. If you're having fun, tell your friends about the show. We, the more, When it comes to food and wine, I'm a firm believer, the more the merrier. So, I mean, the more folks we can get to, to join, the more fun, obviously. And let's see. Oh, gosh. Trying. Oh, back to Behringer. You got a rough life, Oscar, I'm telling you. Every weekend you're in wine country. I'm very jealous, but enjoy the heck out of that. Oh gosh, Palmas. I'm dying to go to Palmas. I love their wines. They're fantastic, but I have not visited there yet. So please let me know what you think, okay? And thanks. Where is the wine spot this weekend? You know, it's funny. I was actually going to mention um, after this broadcast, we're heading over for those of you who are here in Delray Beach or in, you know, Palm Beach County, we're heading over to City Oyster on Atlantic Avenue within the hour. And if you want to come, come over and join us, we'd love to share a glass with you. But other than that, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure what else we have planned this weekend. So, but that's where we'll be tonight. And that's all I know right now. So thanks again for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next week, next Friday at 3 p.m. And I hope you can join me then. And until again, until then, cheers to you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Thanks.